we are currently in Jujuge, a non ceded territory historically frequented by the Anishinaabeg Nation. However, as our audience and panelists come from many parts of what we are known as Quebec, it is important. It is important to remember that many Aboriginal nations have roamed this vast territory for thousands of years through the paths that they have taken and retaken on circumstances territory. They have developed their own attachment to these territories from which have emerged their know-how, their knowledge of life, their worldview and their culture. We invite you to share in the chat the Indigenous peoples who have shaped the territory you are in today. is a little um, circle at the bottom. Donc il y a l'interprétation simultanée, c'est le cercle en bas. Je m'excuse parce que j'ai oublié de le dire. So the interpretation is at the bottom, it's a circle that you can press on. Merci beaucoup Leila pour uh, nous avoir Thank you Leila for the reminder of this interpretation and this beautiful interpretation. My name is Audrey and I am the Assistant General, so I welcome you to the third webinar in Innovative and Promising Practices Promoting Reconciliation, Indigenization and Decolonization of Post-Secondary Environments and Aboriginal Student Success and Persistence. Today's webinar will focus on admissions policies, reserve spaces, and dedicated stepping stones program for Aboriginal students. In order to increase the number of Indigenous students enrolled in post-secondary education, many institutions in Quebec have adopted alternative admissions policies or have reserved spaces in their professional program. For students who have not completed high school, some stations and college uh, offer springboard programs adapted to the needs and realities of Indigenous students. These adapted measures aim to facilitate the transition of students to the post-secondary institutions, increase the Indigenous presence to professional programs, and therefore their presence in the labor market, and to take into consideration consideration a wider range of experiences and realities specific to the First Peoples. They seek to better support and accompany them. Today, we welcome people who are working within these services and who have made it possible to put these measures into place. As our first panelist, we welcome from Laval University Schools of Rehabilitation, Andréanne Blanchette, accompanied by physiotherapist student, Mira Bacon Moreau. We would like to point out that Laval University has spaces reserved for Aboriginal students in 20 of their program. So, Andréane, hello. It is a pleasure for me to be with you today to give you some information on the reserve spaces in the program, specifically for rehabilitation programs. I will start by sharing my screen with you, if you allow me. And I'll put it in the presentation mode. Do you see the screen sharing here? And can you see the notes on the side or can you see the whole slide? Well, we see the notes. Well, I'm not surprised at all. Is it possible for you to share it yourselves? Thank you very much. I will start by speaking to you about by presenting myself on my end. I am director and teacher of physiotherapy programs at the University of Laval. And I have under my responsibility with a colleague when it comes to admission processes programs, of course, in, in the uh, physiotherapy programs. So a little bit later, I'll tell in a few minutes, we will have the opportunity to hear Mila bacon Moreau, who will speak to you about her experience as um, a person who benefited from these reserve spaces in the program. Simply to tell you, I just want to start with giving you a few information on the professions that you can find in um, rehabilitations when it comes to the programs that we offer here. We're talking about the audiology program, as well as the ergotherapy program, and the physiotherapy program, and the orthophony program. So you know that these are health professionals who are working in these different domains. And of course, they, are, they have common elements that link these programs. And different professions are 
sort of characterized by the fact that they have different treatments of, of these health issues. So when it comes to the audiology, we are talking about um, problems with hearing when it comes to um, not hearing anything um, or a difficulty, all sorts of issues that are in link with the um, hearing when it comes with the orthophony it's with troubles with speaking communication issues and ergotherapists will put a focus on the study of um, when it comes to the the daily activities by the individuals that they follow so how to ensure that each individuals will be able to realize the important activities uh, for for them significant significant um, activities so physiotherapy, we will look at uh, physical deficiencies when it comes to illnesses due to um, aging or accidents. Um, all ages are uh, being treated. So I don't see the share screen. Um, can Audrey hear? Does it work? I see the screen sharing on my end and it works for me. So yes, thanks a lot. So what I wanted to talk in to I wanted to talk about what led us to create these reserve spaces for, for indigenous students. So this, the medical faculty has gathered all the resources in order to have a social, a responsibly social impact. Members were as well invited to preoccupy themselves in, into how to serve the populations in all its diversity, cultural and territorial, including First Nations and Inuits. And so they noticed that there was a lack of um, health professionals in these environments and in these communities. So we'll switch to the next um, slide. What was also understood is that in these programs, there was an underrepresentation of uh, Indigenous students in, from Quebec. So based on these issues and upon these contexts, we based our new, um, our new work, uh, sort of a, our work plan, which offered spaces to these Indigenous students. And this category of admission is a has a specific criteria. I put a list here, if you can see on the screen, I, you can see the different programs that are offered, as well as the, cre the year of the creation, which of course is directed to Indigenous students. And you can see also the numbers of um, places that were reserved, two in ergotherapy, two in physiotherapy, two in orthophony and audiology. And there was only one for audiology for the um, for the students that would want to do these programs. If we go to the next slide, just to give you a little bit more details when it comes to the process, you have to know that in order to be a candidate, you there are a few um, requirements. You have to come from the First Nations, or in, its, in terms of what response to the uh, law to Indigenous peoples. You have to be a Quebec resident, and you have to confirm your status of um, the First Nations or Inuit in Quebec, and it has to be confirmed. And the way that we proceed that in order to confirm the validity of the status is that we, commun we communicate with the Health Commission of First Nations of Quebec and Labrador, uh, particularly right now it's Mr. Siwi that is um, ahead of these uh, processes, and the validation will be done by the commission, uh, to the commission in order to confirm the validity of that status. In other words, uh, you know, I was, well, before I was telling you that there are different, of course, uh, criterias of admission, and they're a bit different than for the, for, it's different for the Indigenous students. I will just resume here the processes and just tell you how it goes when it comes to the process is based on there are two modalities that permit um, this evaluation. So you have to look at the um, so of course we will look at the academic student um, document. We will look as well as how they have been doing during the year. When it comes to uh, their numbers, they have to have a 27 ERG degree. So you see that there's also a interview and following the interview, there's a sort of um, how could we um, 
we get to a sort of a ponderation that permits us to have a better mark of the student and place permits us to have a better global mark, which um, offers a, um, a response to the criteria that we had in place for the indigenous students. The list is created for the people of the First Nations of Quebec. I just give you an information and adding information because often we often have the question that rises, does the test, uh, does the CASPER test, which is a online tool that's used by um, admission processes in different programs by different schools, when it comes to the rehabilitation program for this particular contingency, it, the CASPER is not obligatory, it's not mandatory, it is regular that, um, that it's regularly recommended for the indigenous candid candidates. We tell them to do it because it allows them to reinsert themselves, to insert themselves in regular contingents if they want to. And it also allows other indigenous students to occupy this, these places in these specific contingent. These are the bit of the information that I wanted to share with you um, in a very brief manner. I want to present you Mila Bacon Moreau. She has a few words to share with her experience in terms of our and her experience in our program. Thank you, Andréanne. My name is Mila Bacon Moreau, and I'm a student, I'm a second year student at Laval University in physiotherapy, and I'm Inu from Pescamid. Um, community. Just to give you a short story of my my life, I moved out of the community when I was 12 yeah, to, in Chicoutimi to start high school, and my mother was going back to school as well. And I remember when I was going to high school, I had, of course, knew that there had been some really reserved uh, places for us as students. I wasn't um, in accord with that. I wasn't, in, I wasn't agreeing with that because I thought it was a form of discrimination because at my age, I wanted to um, be like everybody, to be in the mass and just be a regular student. So when I came in, I had a few difficulties with French when I started school. Obviously, I had some bad marks and it had an impact on um, the coter. And I remember, my mother had told me to, she had counseled me to accept the um, additional measures that we had for our people. And so, and take the additional time to do the text. And I used to say, no, I don't need it. And she told me one day it'll hit you right in a while when you realize that you are not in completely in the French world because you're not thinking about French because I, my first language was Inu. So sometimes I had difficulties with communication in French. So, you know, at first at school, and I remember as well as, as I was speaking with my friends, they hadn't moved out of the community, and they went to Sejep to follow their, their studies, and it had been, and it was very hard for them to adapt themselves to the city life and the communication in French. All in all to say that the fact that there are reserved spaces for in, in very contingent programs, it um, allows us to help ourselves adapt to this new life. It's not, you know, it helps us. It's a bit of my parenthesis on what I wanted to say for the spaces. My interest for physiotherapy um, came from my love for volleyball, which I played in high school, and I was highly trained in it, and I had a lot of uh, um, wounds when it came to my, uh, my, um, my knees, and um, my dowels and my coach had told me to go see a physiotherapist. And that's when I started having a very great interest for um, physiotherapy. You know, as a patient, of course you feel sort of autonomous with um, your, your, your healing. And so they ask you how you're going to heal yourself. And I liked that. And I like that the physiotherapist there, this priority is about the patient's um, goal to return to sport. And so I recommend these programs, these rehabilitation programs, because you put the emphasis on the, on the patient's autonomy and what we can also bring to the patient itself as a physiotherapist. When it comes to my university life, I never felt different on campus. I just understood that I had a lot to learn to, um, to my colleagues when it came to my culture, my history, even my language. Sometimes I teach new words to my friends and I enjoy that. 
And as a member of First Nations and a student, I find that it's very important to talk about the subject because it is by experience and our knowledge that we will be able to self-determine ourselves and go forward. So thank you very much. You will understand that Mila is an excellent representative uh, of the First Nations of Quebec when it comes to the participation of the program. And I think it really enriches our program to have her presence. Audrey, would you like to share um, our my last slide? It's just to sort of to resume on a um, basically the program itself to report on how it happened, you can see that the decisions had a very great success because at the end we had many more um, candidates in the four programs in terms of the last years, it's been growing. So you'll see, you can take notice that we have about um, more than a dozen studies, students that have um, been candidates in these four programs. I want to underline the fact that there has been 12 people um, in, and there are spaces, of course, there are 12 people in, but we, it, having all this reserved space is not enough because we have to do more work on the promotion um, of the rehabilitation, but a promotion of our programs, a promotion of the spaces for registered people. We also encourage ourselves, you know, when we look, we see that we make many offers to indigenous students. And we understood from that, that certain candidates have offers in our program or they have offers in other programs because they were able to make demands in other programs as well. So it's not just ours and that to us is a success. And we will be very glad to take your questions as well, if you have any. Audrey, I think we can't hear you. Of course you can't hear me. I wanted to thank you very much for this sharing. It's also very nice to see um, how you implemented this, this new process and to see also the numbers because these spaces are critical there, of course, and they're limited. There are many people who register and uh, who cannot get in. So there's a lot of work to do. And I'm happy that you underlined that. We next is Jean Simon Paradis Charlebois, who's a director at the uh, University of Republic for recruitment. And Katina Pro, who's a student in second year student in law. They will share the um, alternative politic and draw. And our colleague in the chat will uh, be there for past present um, past of presentators who can if you have any questions right on the programs the programs uh, the reserve space programs at the Levan University so I'm going to open up uh, uh, the spotlight Jean Simon thank you I'm going to share my screen does it work? Does it work? Yes, we see the screen, but it's not in the full screen. If I put this in this way, does it work? Do you see my notes or you can't see them? Okay. Um, hello, very glad to be here and to participate to this presentation. So I was uh, briefly, I'm Jean-Simon Charlebois. I am responsible of the law faculty for indigenous uh, people, but also in the institutional manner at the university, I contribute to the implementing of the action plan for communication with the indigenous uh, community. So my personal background, I'm a student. I um, I studied right now at the, the, I'm having a bachelor's at law. I also have a MBA at Sherbrooke. I worked as a lawyer for a while with, um, Indigenous, communi indigenous communities and Inuit communities of First Nations. Um, I worked for about eight years in the Indigenous Affairs, in the implementation of programs, and I've been at the Sherbrooke University for the last three years in the um, handling of the, um, the registering and admissions. I will not go so much on the technicalities linked with the 
sort of administration legislations, I think that it goes, uh, it aligns very well with what you just heard in terms of the validation of the status. So what I'm going to present to you, it's more about why we adopted this politic. And even though I will not spend enormous time on it, I just really would like to hear Leila share her experience up to now. I will also speak to you about the um, conditions of success. Our students um, will also share their biggest challenges when it came to this new uh, process and the implementation of it. We have a policy that's been in a legislation that's been in ever since 2017. We've had new students in 2018. We've had about 10 students who joined uh, the bachelors, the law bachelors. Usually you need a uh, 30 quarter uh, to come in the law program. It is a very um, contingent program. The students that we've accepted up to now had between 21 and 29 of uh, our code. And um, I think on that aspect, not solely on it, It allows us to understand more about the student, but it's more about the interview um, that will tell us, that will give us the possibility, be able to give us the possibilities of the students or understand rather the possibilities of the student and what the student can do. Why we adopted this sort of a new legislation and why we adopted this sort of um, new way of doing, we, we do know that uh, we all know what happened throughout history. And what we came to realize is that there are many different ways and many lives that affect the R score, that affects our candidates as well. So um, many students grew in the communities, and many grew up outside of their communities. So they have different lives. And for many of them, it's uh, the, the life situation was what had affected the R code, the R score, as well as indigenous students are very underrepresented in um, in the in the law uh, the law area, and it would be. It would be a great exactly to have them so that they can um, be represented in, in, in line. I did that at first in, in my career, and I noticed that it was very important that to be to have this representation in terms of the relationship, the trust relationship, and also the cultural akinness as well. And I think that um, by giving this option for the indigenous students to become lawyers, I think it would contribute as well to the society and the relationship we have with them. I'd say as well that it is in our new sort of legislation is, um, is new. We of course have a very specific measures that allow to identify the sort of barriers that happens with admission and it, and, ex and we have to see what happens with the representation in our programs and what enables them to get them in. So our objective is really to look at these barriers. It exists, our program exists in, in a, the law uh, law um, program, but also in ergotherapy. It's new, it's been new. There's been a first, uh, first contingent group, but we are very happy that we have this first group. Then what are the conditions? What are the success conditions? Our students are not any different than the other ones sometimes, yes, because they've had uh, challenges such as being parent student. And uh, for example, there are colleagues that we, to some colleagues, we need to make more uh, an awareness work with them because of the different realities of indigenous lives. But once that they come in, they integrate themselves very well and they do things that they can do for others. We can do the same thing that we do with other students. Starting from the first year, we'll have a meeting every week to see how they're doing, what, how are your students, how are your studies going? We'll talk about the exams, finals, midterms. I'll talk about it with them uh, during the first year. And in the second year and on the third year, there's uh, 
uh, it goes very well. We'll be able to create a space near my office and to see if they want to study or we'll do some partnerships between a second student and a second year student and a first year student for them to help each other out. Um, so this kind of pairing is important. It's sort of like a resource person. We thought it was paternalist at first to do this, but then again, it revealed itself to be a very good initiative. The students were saying that it helped them a lot. It gave them a support they needed and um, they were able to understand university better, of course, giving them an anchor point. We also have parent students. We know that there will be bigger challenges. So we'll try to reduce the workload uh, the, or rather the class load. We will adapt uh, the program to the needs of these uh, parents because it's not always easy. I'll say our experience up to now, the higher the R score is higher, the higher the score R is, and the better the person has success at school. It also is, it's good, but it also has its limits. A student that has 27 for R score or even less, if they have difficulty throughout their schooling, it won't be because they are indigenous. It will be because of family reasons, health reasons, or whatnot, but it is not related to um, the fact that they're indigenous. Our students are very good. They perform very well and in general do well. I think that our biggest challenge is to be able to join, um, is to convince people to apply to the program, even getting them to understand our, our legislation towards our program. And we don't have a, uh, of course, a big number of people in. We don't have a, a natural pool of indigenous um, candidates because it's a challenge to reach them, but we'd have to work really hard on promoting the university, telling them that it's a great environment for them, but our challenge is to go see them. So oftentimes I do one-on-one -on -one meetings and that allows me to bring them in and have them um, post their sort of, you know, become candidates for the school. Often it's a great decision for them when they apply. It's a, it's a great thing for them because it's a very high level program. It's, it's a lot of work. We'll sometimes adapt and have, you know, fewer classes or it, unfortunately it's not a program that you can do part-time. It's a full-time program. I will leave my contacts here if you would like to hear more about our initiative uh, here at the university. There is here a email and the university address. That is pretty much the best way to reach me. So the email is the best way to reach me. And also we, we would like to inspire ourselves with what our um, medical faculties um, do, which is a lot more centralized. And there's a lot of work that we'd have to do in order to get there. But pro probably that is a, an objective that we want to have in the future. So I will close this and finish that. I will invite Leila to answer a few questions. So if I do this like this, hold on. So to take the sharing, the screen sharing, Leila, are you there? Yes, I am. I was really happy to have Leila today because uh, her last the final exam was no later than yesterday. So I, I'm happy that she's here and to know that the end of her semester is really crazy. You know, the students are in focus mode and um, completely sucked into their studies. So um, thank you very much, Leila. I would like you to talk to me about the, how was your admit, uh, admission process like last year, right? How did that go for you? On my part, it went really well. I find that it was something that was expected very essential for students, for Indigenous students, because as Jean-Simon mentioned, the R score does not reveal all of the student's potential. 
And I find that it's something that is very interesting for Indigenous students, knowing that they have different realities than non-Indigenous students. And um, on my part, the presentation letter was something that permitted, well, according to me, it permitted me to, it gave me more motivation because not only did I have the motivation to do a bachelor's in law, but that's why I applied and that was the conditions for me. We also did a, an interview when you came in, right? In the interview, we, we always have an indigenous person during the interview. How did you find that? How did you find the interview at that time? I found that to be extremely interesting because we were able to realize that we also have to have a lot of judgment to be able to give our opinions. And I think that was the essence of the interview. Well, we wanted to get that from the students, right? That that truth and that opinion. And I thought that it was really interesting to have a, an Indigenous lawyer who was... Um, it was extremely motivating to have someone who had succeeded where you would like to succeed. And that gave me a big motivational boost. And ever since you've been here in the uh, law faculty, how do you, how would you characterize your, uh, your feelings? Like the fact that you are indigenous, does it change something? And did you find that you had a certain label during your schooling? No, not at all. To be indigenous is just, it's not something that I'm going to talk, I'm going to speak for myself because it's not everybody's reality. To, for me, it didn't give me any label to be, uh, the, the, the challenges are the same thing for me or for the non-indigenous students. I'm going to persevere when it comes to me. And on my part, I see no difference between an indigenous student and a non-indigenous student in the bachelor's program. Do you think that more awareness is needed for uh, to your colleagues? Yes, of course. I think that uh, the colleagues are not always aware of the reality of indigenous students or indigenous peoples. But between high school and university, I saw that people were becoming far more interested in our reality. I think it's more the fact that the more that we talk about it, the more, the more people are interested in it and um, manifest their interest. Of course, you don't know right now where you're going exactly, but what are your career perspectives? Or maybe your experiences till now are pretty interesting. When I, what you did up to now is really interested. So yeah, I've had the opportunity to work um, in with the, Band Council of uh, my community, Machines, I had the opportunity to work with a um, lawyer. It was extremely enriching, and it gave me the um, the desire to work with for to work for my community as well. So that is a wrap up for us. Um, if there are any questions, uh, they're all very welcomed. If you have any later, thank you very much, Jean Simon. And Leila as well for this sharing. I find it very interesting to see Jean Simon, you um, exposed and showed the nuances and the preconceptions and certain challenges. And I really knew about your life process, and I was just really happy to to meet you and to know more about you. So, without waiting, we will. Um, Dr. Evans Villeneuve, responsible of the uh, medical university pro uh, medical program at Laval University, and so I will will put just one a little board here. Thank you, Dre. Hello, all. Evans Villeneuve. I'm a psychiatrist by profession, but I will but I have a university uh, role. I took this responsibility when it, when we were the provincial, as a provincial responsible of the program and the training program of indigenous and Inuit um, people in um, our program, in the medical program. We have an integrated program when it comes to 
um, the province. The history of it, we are at our 15th year, right? So it's been, it's been quite some time. The idea is that the OMS uh, had given some directives in order to um, in the OMS wanted to, wanted us to be more conscious about the first people's needs, uh, health needs. So there was a, a an assembly in a long house. It was absolutely fascinating at the time in 2008. I was with um, Stanley Bonan that many of you know. And we saw the practices that started emerging when it came to the West, notably uh, to enhance and to help the admission of indigenous students in the medical faculty. And that was the demand of that, of, of that association for Canada. And so we were a lot more solid. Uh, we were able to um, attack the problem when it came to the R score. We were able to lower that because it was a 33, 35. It was um, very hard to access and supported by everything that was being done in the West. It was a, a, a short battle. We were very well supported by, by the um, ministries. Uh, and at the time, there was a whole plan to sort of populate the professional world with all types and so that's what we see today and so we were at the beginning of this um adventure for the for the first nations and so we worked in proximity with the uh Sius of quebec laval labrador uh, labrador and one decade so our conditions was to have a our score at 28 it also they had to come from First Nations and that had to be validated and verified on in the Quebec instances. And as well as to go through the process by which the students, uh, the medical students uh, go through. If you know, you may know the mini, sort of the mini interviews uh, between 10 and 12 interviews in line and they were measuring all sorts of competencies by 12 evaluators and so that is a very robust uh, process but it gives us a very good look at uh, the person there was also an r score and there was also an, another individual interview and at the beginning at first it was we had to, that people had to show it we we're able to understand uh, the people from the indigenous communities and their attachment to the community. Of course, there are many tools today. Um, are the tools today are the R score? There's still the individual interviews that is done. Um, I'm an assistant, but also I. There are people from the First Nations that are evaluators as well, who. We have the mini interviews, the multiple mini interviews that the people must pass at McGill. So it's centralized. Those as well, some will go into the regular uh, program. I would like to uh, show you the next numbers, the next slide, which has numbers. At the beginning, what we were authorized to do was to have a particular contingent group of four um four spaces outside of the regular um space. so we had four spaces in quebec you can see the evolution during these last 15 years we have two in 2008 we had four authorized posts in 2018 we had six authorized posts for quebec and in 2022 we had eight authorized posts for quebec what was very interesting, if um, I don't know if you saw it in your program, but we have a, if there's a post that's not filled, we have three years to fill it. So there are some years where if you look at um, 2009, there was only one admission, which gave us which gave us three possible admissions plus the other one. And that's interesting because there are years we have far more candidates and sometimes less. And what is interesting to see here is that we started with very, very few uh, 
doctors from indigenous nations. And so we came from very far. Uh, I think there was about um, the other presentation, the other presentators before me have uh, described well, all the reasons and complexities behind the reasons for which we had to work more in order to attain our objectives. If we see the evolution, we started from three candidates the first year, and now we are at 71 people, 71 persons that have been admitted to the program since in the last 15 years. And if you see, we are preparing the next process for, 2000, for 2023, and we have 11 spaces for our indigenous communities for the four universities of Quebec when it comes to the medical faculties. It's very interesting to see in this progression is that there are very few um, people who abandon the program. These uh, programs have not been abandoned necessarily um, uh, for a health reasons or whatnot. It's just to go in different orientations. What was interesting to see was that one of the objectives of the program was to create, to have a role model for the youth who stay in school and who are interesting, interested in superior studies beyond Seja. And we see it. We saw the progression, the rising progression, and we saw the progression of the admission of students for the uh, medical faculties and the medical classes. And in December, we have 16 candidates for the 2023 process and we have up to the month of March to fill in our, our spaces. And so it's very interesting. And so our model worked well. And we have many, many, many schools for our younger students or those that have that come from different professions. I think that when it comes to the health professions, they do it as well. They accompany and meet these students. There are all sorts of dimensions um, in the way that we conduct our operations. Today, we have about 30 youth that became doctors who are on the territory, not necessarily in their communities, but relatively um, preoccupied by the communities. Uh, many of them, a few of them are specialists and they will give about a week or three weeks. But what is interesting is to change uh, the aspect of the systemic discrimination, which was very heavy and present, and it's to see the indigenous doctors that are appearing everywhere. And so we're extremely proud of this program. One thing as well, there's Kiuna. I don't know if you know Kiuna. It's, um, it's the Odanak Sejep. They were accompanied by other Seychelles, but they now became a autonomous, uh, an autonomous establishment dedicated to the integration of uh, indigenous cultures in the dis school disciplines for the graduation of Seychelles programs. Big, novel uh, big news in Laval University, there was a great moment. The same dynamic which had been implemented for the university networks had been um, created for all of the university disciplined. What we are calling is the house of knowledge, which integrates all the cultural um, and historical knowledge of indigenous communities spread throughout all the school disciplines. And so the, the university signed this document, this treaty with the, the First Nation signed it with the university. And I think it's a great step. I will end on that. For those that want more information, we have a website. I'm sorry, I should have left it to you before and I didn't write it. It's called je deviens médecin.com. What's interesting as well is we'll put a an emphasis on on how we can do this medical program in nine different places instead of just having it in Laval University, uses and use associate campuses. And I also want to underline the presence of Louise Tanguay, who will um who will put her video on. And Louise Tanguay is our coordinator for all of our um, medical faculties. She accompanies the youth from the start. When they start understanding that they want to get into the program, she accompanies them. So th that's what it is. I'm open to your questions as well. I will now, I will now let Emmanuel speak. Bonjour. Hi. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Evans. 
Kwai Daniwese Emmanuel Obomsawin. My name is Emmanuel Obomsawin. I am Epeneki. I'm Epeneki Ascended. We were talking about Kiuna. I am linked to the Odena community, very close to Drummondville. And as we were explaining before, I am a graduate of the program of the Indigenous contingent in the uh, medical faculty, as well as I am of the 2000, I t finished my studies in 2016 and graduated in 2022. And I followed a specific program in psychiatry in Laval, which I finished. Um, I am now a, a psychiatrist in the national capital of Quebec. I will talk to you about uh, the last 10 years of my, 14 years of my life. I'm also waiting because I have strategic choices that I made. I dedicated my training, my complementary training, because as we are specialists, if we want to work in universities, we have to get an additional training. I am preparing for a certificate, a diploma, a specialized diploma with the National Administration School in the, when it comes, and I'm studying special indigenous contexts. And so it was very well welcomed by my organization and they supported me in this process. And I have a particular interest as a doctor in terms of the how we should think about the way that we serve our indigenous communities and what are the innovations that we could come up with. I'm talking to you about the future, but we're also here to speak about the past. In 2012, it was a, I, I returned to school. I went back to a um, faculty. I had finished a nursing program at the University of Montréal. I was not a typical student, but I was a typical student to go in um, medical program, medical studies. In the medical studies, we have few are called. Many are called, but few are elected. There are many people who want to do this profession. It's an absolutely passionate, it's a passioning um, career, and many people want to do that. And so to select, to make to, to, to do a selection of all, of all these people who want to come into this program. Um, is a very difficult task, which I would not want to do. What we know is that the indigenous people were underrepresented in the programs. And we consider that to be, if we compare that to the rest of the population, the percentage was very low for many diverse reasons, which we've spoken about. This is why this program was implemented and opened uh, these contingents so that people can go in the workforce um, and those that can go in the military force as well. There are very different types of areas in which we can work at. For me, it was my open door and it was my saving grace because I was not able to have a, I was only able to get an R score of 32. It seems very absurd, but it's, it's interesting though, because I think that even with a 27 R scored or even a 26 R score, a student can follow medical studies very well. It's, um, it's a tool that we use in order to select uh, people who will study in the program. But um, else than that, we can still work with the students who don't have a, 30, a 33 R score. We also, it was, The biggest factor for me was a human factor around this contingent that we we're talking about a selection process, but we were actually supported through this process. We could ask questions. We did the interviews and my opening door was was very positive. It was I was welcomed, supported at the Laval University and I was welcomed in a great family and I was able to uh, have medical studies, you know, medical studies is as hard as doing a pro a, a law uh, diploma, you know, you there's many things to do many steps. But a particular step, a particular thing in a program is the competition. Once that we have our diploma in pocket, we have to get an additional, a complementary training. Once we have four years of medical studies, I'm not ready to get to, to have people give birth. I'm, it, there are many things that I can't do. I, you have to get an extra training to become a psychiatrist and so on. So there are many things to consider in our field. It's not always evident because there's a strong competition, but there are different vectors um, that 
help us and support us through this process. So I will tell that this is our main challenge for the medical field. Now we know and we've seen it when it comes to our candidates, many have finished and are practicing and it's all, all these agents of change who have uh, the health of the indigenous community at heart that will be able to drive great change in the medical community. This is what I wanted to share with you. I also saw my clock that tells me, tick tack, Emmanuel, I need to go. So I thank you so much. I say unene and thank you for listening. And thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Evans and Emmanuel, I think it was very fun to see to which point the program has evolved, how well it has evolved. And um, I've heard a lot about you and it is a really great joy to see you today. And as last um, guest, I will invite Marie-Ève Castonguet, who um, is director at Affaires et Scolaire at the she worked one year to the implementation of the Tremplin program of the Indigenous students, and she will talk about that today with us. So, Marie-Ève, the microphone is to you. Hello, everyone. I, it's a great joy to meet you. I think that I am the only one that comes from the CEGEP as an individual pedagogical assistant. Our project is spread on three years. We hope to keep it after. It's there because there were needs and it's a project that was accepted in the spring of 2021 and I was hired in the summer of 2021 to work on the development and the conception of this program and the project and I was hired as individual pedagogical assistant and at first it, I had to create some bridges with the communities and our main partners were the regional center of Pisamin. When we started working on our Tremplin Deck Première Nation project, it, we, it wasn't well elaborated. And we were told about different needs because we need uh, different students from Pisamit and other communities from Côte Nord. And we, we started by working on the needs that were told to us by the different workers, different assistants in the community, different agents of the community. And so I, I started working with the orientation advisor at uh, the uh, Regional Educational Center of Pesamit. And we want to do well, but oftentimes, the sort of the the danger with this is to think that we have the best idea and we end up not consulting anyone and especially the ones that we have to become partnered with and we want to do things with them so we should do it because we're doing things for them and for them so essentially we need to partner up with them so i think at first it was a bit difficult it was more of a um of a consciousness work and we we had to know what we what we needed to do uh which would answer to the needs of our students and so with Tremplin deck we had to we knew that people wanted to prepare themselves better to uh Seychelles studies so when we look at kiona and a TB CEGEP, it offers a, uh, these programs, Tremplin Deck, for the Indigenous students. We are the first to have had a DSS.6, so the students can integrate a Tremplin Deck program, which will, and they won't have more than 10, you know, high school units, which gives them a, a sort of a, a a good transition between high school studies and CEGEP. So it's a micro program. And so we're trying to make it more securing for them to transfer on to CEGEP studies. What also works really well is that I worked in Bicomo to accompany our first students. Uh, had a first court in 2022. And our first students have been there for uh, for, yeah, for a little while. So it's a DES uh, minus 10 units, but it's on three semesters. So they have three semesters to finish their high school studies by interrogating their CEGEP studies. And so I worked with a first year with the students. I accompanied them in the community twice a week. And so the two days that they were in CEGEP, I was as well there. And so, 
it's something it's a project that is that wants itself to be when we talk about securing environments and cultural securing it wants it to be uh, in in this way we want it individualized programs to secure them. And that's it. I um, speak in the past because now I take care of students, uh, more technical program students. I have a colleague who taught at Tampin Deck who will take on the role that I had before on the project, on the pilot project, as to accompany these indigenous students in their integration. I think I have this at heart, I coordinate uh, the community of the welcoming community at Seychelles. It's a community, a committee that exists uh, that's been around for a few years. And there we are able to help our students so that they can feel home when they come to our school. If I continue, I could do um, a screen sharing and present um, and present our Tremplin Deck project. It's a, a power. It's the PowerPoint that I show students when I meet them in the information session. When we do our recruiting, of course, we. It's a pilot project with, that's not very well known by our students. Does it work? Yes. So you see it well? Because I have a second screen, that's why. Hold on. So the big lines, this is a securing bridge to to a bridge to Seychelles studies and help them finishing the units that they don't have in order to progress in the a Seychelles formation, a training. Our agents from the Pesamit uh, and I work together for in order to help our students that come to our school. What I say to the students is, what what makes it different? Because there are you know tremplin, there are regular tremplin deck. What is it that we go towards a tremplin deck for First Nations when we are a First Nation student? What brings you to come to the program? Because it's not it's not an it's not mandatory, but what could be good? It's to be more prepared for studies. That's their desire. A student was talking about it before. Previously, she said the first student, I think, the one that was studying in physiotherapy, she said, I, as much as I wanted, you know, to be an independent student, I didn't want to be part of the reserve programs. I, I came to the realization that I needed it. And, you know, sometimes when we come from our communities, we don't come with the same preparation So the idea here of the Tremplin Deck is to pair our students and help them um, face those students. And so we help them and we frame, give them a better frame for school. Um, there are many students that are very worried about their, you know, their schooling. And it, it, this program is to help the students have a better orientation. That is one of the needs that had been mentioned to us is that when it comes to orientation, oftentimes they, had their tendencies to go into school um, school programs or school areas that were that had already been investigated by our programs but it didn't mean that they were really aware or self-aware of their abilities to do this program so Tremplin Deck helps that it also helps to complete units that are not, um, that some of the students don't have, the units needed to go uh, to Sejap. Now those, for example, that have their uh, high school diploma can go direct, can as well do the tremplin, for example, if they need to work on the vocational choices that they wanna make. The advantages, if I look at the benefits of tremplin tech, is that it's a process, it's a, it's a, it's a tailored program that takes in that takes in account the needs and the 
challenges that Indigenous students face. I look at, for example, strategies, writing strategies, comprehension strategy, reading strategies. So oftentimes, um, when the students come from Indigenous communities, their first language, for example, is Inu. I'm talking about, I'm, I'm going to talk about my home here. So oftentimes there are they have to learn what has to be decoded they have to learn how to decode what's said in class so that has to do with comprehension so oftentimes we also have a class that helps people develop their numerical numerical abilities and that will help them integrate their regular program for example and say you know help them work with different platforms, how to research, to do research. These are activities that help them know themselves better. They can participate to the different workshops. We'll talk about success strategies, um, studying strategies, and we'll relate that to the role of the student and the direction that they're going into. Because there are small closed groups and preserved to Indigenous students, we have the opportunity to really understand what's going on on a deeper level. We want we get to understand what they want to study. We have the opportunity to organize activities, you know, related to arts. We also have uh, outings outside of the territory. And what's interesting is that we also formed a committee with teachers who work at Tremplin Deck. And there's a lot of content adap uh, adaptation that has to do like philosophy or the literature class. We adapted with um, indigenous literature. I talk about physical education class where the teacher will um, take into account what the students want to do in their yard outside. So our students are consulted very much and our students are very open to it and it gives them the desire to work more and our teachers also want to remain in work. Our students also feel uh, concerned, they also feel considered and important. As I said, it's the program is on three semesters is the program if the students only want to do one semester and they feel ready to integrate uh, to integrate uh, sejab they they can do it they don't have to do the three uh, semesters at the first semester just like i said the first semester we try to make sure that we don't have more than two classes not more than two days um, planned in school because a lot of them are finishing their units for high school, then that should be the priority because if you don't graduate high school, you won't be able to integrate the SEJAP. So in that uh, sense, we try to progressively finish their program, their high school program. So this is relative to the institution because well, I'm not going to say too much because it's not really pertinent. One thing that really impressed me and that I find very interesting when it comes to our uh, students um, process, as a pedagogical assistant, I see students from high school who integrate SEJAB studies with missing six units. And when that happens, I have no numbers to give you, but the students at the end of um, at the end of the process, they end up understanding that it's very hard to combine their final units with SEJEP studies. And they realize that it's far better to complete these units beforehand. Contrarily to what you see, our indigenous students who are in SEJEP and we welcome, we have two cohorts as we speak, are very persevering. Although sometimes they're lacking 10 high school units, they still persevere. I'm under the impression that they are, that all of that is linked to the support that is offered and the, and the collaborative work that is done between the community, between the, community and the SEJAP in order to 
support the students in their studies. And that's it. That's, uh, I think that I have gone, uh, pretty much said everything concerning this subject. Should you have any questions, it will be, I will be glad to answer them. Thank you so much, Ariev. Yes, as you said, the your representative of the Seychep, but I, I was happy. I, I thought it was important to show what was going on in Seychep. So it's it's a great honor for, for us to have you because we don't always include the Seychep in our discussions. Oftentimes there are fun things that are done and I think it's important to talk about it. We have a first question, Jean-Simon. Audrey, before we go to the question, I just wanna remind people, I put it in the chat and I'm gonna put it again. There is a, uh, commentary forum. I wanted to thank you in advance. Uh, if you, I want to thank you in advance. Please, if you can take a couple of minutes just to do it, because our feedback is very precious to us, and it helps us in the planning and the organization of our webinars and the other activities of our organization. So, just in case you have to go, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you so much of this uh, reminder. Shanet asked a question if you permit me to cite you. Because spaces are reserved to indigenous communities, what do you do if you have a doubt on the origins of a person? As you know, there has been some usurpation cases before in Canada. I will pass the puck to my coordinator because that's what she does on the regular. Uh, Louise, can you, can you say that? Can you answer to that? So we have a process, a validation process in order to identify members of First Nations. You have to present your card, your valid status card. There are many models of, a, of, of status card throughout the years, there have been many, but we know them well. And we will go with our criteria for the program, for the medical, Faculty. It's very easy to identify with a card. We can we can actually see those that really have the status according to the law on the federal level. So it's it's pretty easy to verify. Do I understand that because there are non-status? Are the non-status people excluded from the process? In our program, yes, you really have to have the indigenous status registered with the federal government. So it takes the indigenous status with the card that goes with it. For our program, I wouldn't want to talk about the other programs. I think that each program has their cri particular criteria in terms of how they accept First Nations that are not from Quebec or that would come from another province and who would live in Quebec. I think that it can be done in other programs as well, but for the fa medical faculty, these are our um, rules. I was wondering uh, when it comes to the legal, on the legal level, can you legally do that? Can we identify statuses and to refuse those that are not in status? Yes, we can. It was um, it was accepted, and these are the rules that um, are applied, and they were decided by the APNQL at the beginning of the program. And um, you have to have rules in place to see who can and who cannot have access to this program. And these are the rules that were established. And yes, I think that um, it went through lawyers, it was verified. And yes, we can actually uh, refuse someone who um, declares themselves of um, uh, declares themselves to be First Nations, but don't have the um, status. If I can add, you know, not to throw another debate when it comes to uh, this particular subject. We have a teacher, Maxime Saint-Hilaire, that. Uh, who's specialized in um, 
constitutional uh, law and um, indigenous rights, uh, we have a lot of uh, recurring demands of people who are not uh, indigenous, but pretend to be so. And we have a very specific procedure to not only base ourselves to, obviously the, the, the card does simplify our task, but it is not the only way to verify the identity of an indigenous person. So at that point, uh, to verify someone that doesn't have a status, there would be a counter verification in the community in which the community, uh, in, in the community from which the person says stems from. And in reality, what happens we will have people from the um, Indigenous Alliance who will write to us, who will ask to see if they have access to the program. They will send us a card. The, they will say that the community is not historically uh, recognized. We know that there are some communities in Quebec that are not historically recognized, but it's very easy for us then at that moment to say, to mention and to, to throw out uh, with the fact that the person is not part of a historical community. We have never had a, we've never faced a situation because because with the card comes, comes obviously the reimbursement of school, um, of school fees. And so obviously a lot of people will have advantage. It will be only beneficial for a person to get their card and for their community as well. I will let Martine ask her question or her commentaire or her comment. Thank you, Audrey. Martine Evesque, a teacher in ergotherapy at the University here in Montreal and specialist of uh, Indigenous questions. In the context where there, we see that there's a big decolonization movement and a reconciliation movement in the universities, my question is uh, goes to the students, Mila and Leila and Emmanuel. We talk a lot about the idea that we have to try to reverse um, pedagogical content so that they can reflect the vision or the ways of doing it that are more, um, more traditional, more indigenous, for example, when it comes to uh, the law or health, when it comes to, for example, the well-being concepts, we make a lot of efforts in that ways. But I would like to know what um, you as students, how do you perceive this? How do you see this aspect? and that need and do you did you feel that you were well did you feel recognized and did you feel like you could link yourself to the content did you did you feel linked to the content or not or how did, how did you feel i'll pronounce myself first on my end i Think that it would be something amazing and interesting rather to, to, to if you want change a little bit the ways that people are, are, are teaching maybe a more um indigenous ways of think of teaching but i am very aware that it's something that would be very big to bring if you're going to do this in every class but for example i know that when in law we have indigenous, we study indigenous law, and it's something extremely interesting. <laughs> but are you, uh, am I responding well to your question? Yes, yes, that's what I mean, because I, I, I think that you hadn't spoken to that a lot. In Seychelles, we see the contrast where Mrs. Castonguay was talking about going on the territory, on the land, and adapting the literature content. I just wanted to know how you were perceiving that. I wanted to add to your question, Mrs. Levesque, when it comes to this question, this process, this decolonization process that we all want, and I talk for us, indigenous people will be done on a on a multi level. It'll be done in a school. It starts in schools. It starts in homes until the university. We have a double constraint in that is that the university contents 
have to be scrutinized, meaning specific areas of university programs have to be looked at. There's been a whole movement that was started in the value university was to uh, change certain ways in our classes when it comes to our medical schools we have uh, different stages for students who are interested whether indigenous or non-indigenous they can go in the communities uh, and it's all upon the interest of the student but there's a great effort and, and many projects that are in evolution right now in order to achieve uh, in order to attain our our teachers and our workers so that they know that there is this process this decolonization process in place so that one day as indigenous, we will find our space and that uh, our presence will be underlined if we participate. Now, there are many things that are being organized and articulated in universities. We have to do it. I think that one of my my challenge or rather one of my one of my worries is not to force the movement. I think that ever since it, ever since 2020, there's been a rise in consciousness in terms of indigenous health and that now people just don't want, people are getting are getting tired of hearing of it. And this positive discrimination is not always good, and it can actually bring a negative uh, discrimination. Discrimination. So we have to be we, we we can't forget the Quebec identity, which is which is at a critical point. So it's a great move, and we'll have to continue and go forward together strategically. I'll speak for for Laval University, and I'll talk about, for example, Sherbrooke University. It's things are happening. So many things are being organized, and probably that Sejeps and University will, would have such would gain benefits from discussing and partnering up, because these practices are going to be practiced everywhere. These new practices, rather. Go ahead, Mila. If I could add, you know, I'm really going to align myself with my colleague. I think when it comes to my program, the decolonization process started. And if I think about one of my classes that I had was uh, physiotherapy, health and society, we had to have we had, we had to do a project on e-news. Our work, we, 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 my team chose the Pesame community. So we did a lot of research and we looked at the consequences and the impacts uh, on Inu of, of Inu communities of Pesame. And so I thought it was really, it was really fun to do with my colleagues. I saw some little things like in exams when we when we take a patient names like you know sometimes they'll take a they'll take indigenous names and it makes me smile when I see it but sometimes there are things to correct like sometimes I see name name programs that who still use the Amerindian uh, moniker and so that's not good and that should be changed. Thanks a lot, Mila. Do we have other questions for our guests? Judy, I saw that you opened your microphone. Yeah, I had a question, but I was gonna write it down. Can, may, I, may I speak? Yes, of course. I'm sorry, my camera is not very well oriented. Um, I'm going to come with my question. I'm at the Ortofani School and Audiology School of uh, the Montreal University. We have stash programs in Indigenous communities for audiophony and orthophony. And our goal is that as we, uh, we are at a third year of our program, our hypothesis is that the more we go in the indigenous communities, the more we implicate we implicate ourselves, we will get our professions known. Now, when it comes to the programs that have reserved spaces, do you think or do you have examples of uh, of how of the fruits bared by these initiatives, or are or do you think that we are idealists in our ways of recruiting our candidates? in the indigenous communities. May I respond? For the medical faculty program, we think that 
it's a positive initiative. They're little babies, and we see that the cousins of the first ones who um, registered for the faculty program are actually registering. So we see brothers, sisters, cousins, and we see that the program is um, being popularized by word to mouth. And we see that it actually has huge benefits for their families and their communities. And already the youth are, the young ones are actually understanding that it's possible for them to um, be part of those programs and become doctors or lawyers or whatnot. But it's something that is slowly growing and we have more and more students every year who come to this program and i think that it also shows a lot to the perseverance of these these young these young students and it shows that it's possible to have a great life great job and uh you will be able to access a higher level in after high school and be able to um get great occupations and jobs from it. So now they see, they understand that it is possible for them. And also because they are welcomed very differently than 25 years ago, because all our schools right now are making great efforts to make our schools more welcoming and warmer to the reception of indigenous students. Thanks a lot, it's very encouraging. So I was in a mini webinar before, a health mini webinar, we were talking a lot about, like Louise said, that it showed that there is a possibility that, that with school perseverance that you can access to something different and that it motivates the youth to, to register. And it can be a very beautiful demonstration of the different perspectives, professional perspectives. Thanks a lot for this question, Judith. So go ahead, Martin. I don't want to uh, I don't want to take over the mic. So I'm pretending it's a question. It's a factual question for University of Laval. It's a technical question. When it comes to the admission criteria, I saw that it was pretty different in ergo physio versus audiology and orthophon orthophony, where I see that the uh, uh, the school um, sort of. Uh, the school marks uh, were important uh, and there were different degrees for, uh, uh, depending on the programs. I wanted to know, is it Audrey, is she gone? I'm not sure. And, oh. Different programs have different percentages linked to the academic file and linked, or sometimes it's with the interview. So why, in, for example, in rehabilitation, I couldn't tell you why. I can tell you for rehabilitation why. I'll ask her. So I'm just gonna leave you about a minute here before we, finish this webinar if people have more questions. It's okay, it's okay. I think we've had very rich presentations and I think it also maybe have answered a lot of people's questions. During the presentations, we shared the links, the differences in programs and do not be shy if you have any questions. Throughout the year, you can always send us a Goya, an email, and we will share this question with our colleagues. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to our panelists, to the audience, and I wish you a beautiful um, feast period.